Now we're going to be in uh, Matthew 14 to begin with. Let's go before the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who teaches us what it is you've recorded and preserved for us. It speaks into our heart and does a work to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ, guides us in this path that we're walking behind Jesus. So Holy Spirit, come. We ask for the gift of teaching. Uh, and may the name of Jesus Christ be lifted high and magnified here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. All right, so we uh, continuing study in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. If you weren't here during the announcements, take a, a note. We're gonna, everyone else has four bookmarks in their Bibles. Mark 14, John 18, Matthew 26, and Luke 22. We're going to be in all four Gospels this morning. Uh, last week, we were... I uh, probably ought to fire this thing up. <laughs> last week, we were uh, considering the agony of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, this morning, we're going to look at his betrayal and his arrest there. And we're going to start in Mark chapter 14. And in verse 43... And immediately, while he yet spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. So let's just take stock of what's going on here. Uh, remember last time uh, Jesus went apart from the eight. He brought the three with him. Then he went apart from them and he prayed three times while they slept. Finally, he watched over them while they slept because they're physically and emotionally drained from this day and this night. And the good shepherd tenderly watched over his sheep while they slept until Judas was nearby. And then he woke them up because it was the time. And so now we read that Judas Iscariot, and how is Judas, uh, Judas described? One of the 12. So there's no doubt as to the identity of the betrayer. Judas was a common name. This is Judas Iscariot. We have no doubt who the betrayer is, and he's not alone. He's come with some people. Uh, they are armed. They have swords. They have clubs, as if they're on uh, a mission to capture a violent criminal. And this is a Jewish multitude, by the way, as we consider this, and all four gospels, the leadership of the multitude uh, is the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, and the Pharisees, all Jewish. And the rest of the multitude consists of captain, officers, and soldiers. They're the temple police, if you will. Uh, and what they're on, what they're pursuing, we know is a case of mistaken identity. They think Jesus is one thing, but Jesus is something completely different. They're mistaken as to his identity, and it's going to have some very grave consequences. And what was true in Isaiah's day, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 16, for the leaders of this people caused them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. That was true in Isaiah's day. That is true in Jesus' day. And it is true to our day. Uh, verse 44. And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Take him and lead him away safely. So, Judas, uh, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's with his eleven disciples. Uh, Judas knows, as we will see, Jesus, uh, Judas knows where they are. And so he's leading this multitude of people to Jesus. And he's already given them a prearranged sign. It's going to be him and 11 others, but the one that I kiss, which was a very common greeting, a very friendly greeting then, even now in the, the Middle East. The one that I kiss, that's the one. Take him away safely. Take him away securely. And so the sign is a 
a greeting of friendship, which means the betrayer is on friendly terms, on kissing terms, with the target of this multitude. Uh, And when he kisses the target, take him. The word means using strength. Uh, Seize him. Seize him by force. And lead him away safely, meaning securely. Make sure he doesn't get away. So the enemies are coming. It's at night. The enemies are coming. The enemies of Jesus are coming to him at night. They've left the city and they've come with great force. And now, how would they know where to find him? Let's go to John chapter 18. With the aid of your bookmark, you're there already. (laughs) John chapter 18, last week we considered the first verse, which says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where was a garden, into the which he entered and his disciples. The Garden of Gethsemane uh, was a private garden. Uh, Not many people owned gardens. So whoever had this garden was a wealthy man. Uh, Perhaps, don't know, perhaps Joseph of Arimathea don't know. But anyway, that's where he went. Verse 2, and Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place. For Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. So Judas has been there before. This, in this last week of his ministry, leading up to Passover, every night, Jesus would go with the 12 to the Garden of Gethsemane. Well, this night he went with 11. But the 12th knows where they are because he went there also. And so he comes with uh, the word uh, that the Holy Spirit through John uses is band, a band of men. It means a cohort and a measure of strength of a cohort is like 500 men. So Judas, Judas has come with 500 men, and they're, they're armed. And they've got torches, and they've got lanterns, because physically, it's at night. Spiritually, because they've rejected the light of the world, and they do not believe the word of God, which is the spirit, the sword, rather, the sword of the spirit. So the darkness has a couple of different dimensions to it. Verse 4. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? Jesus, knowing all things that should come upon him. Who is all-knowing? Who knows the seen and the unseen? Who knows the past, the present, and the future? God, the creator of time. Jesus knows. Jesus is God. Now, into the garden comes these 500 men marching, uh, well lit, if you will, and well armed. And what did Jesus do? Did he run? No, he went forth. Uh, He is not surprised that they're there. He's not fearful of them. Instead, remember, he's the good shepherd, he went forth taking the place of the greatest danger. He steps forward to, if you will, meet, greet, confront these, this band of not-so-merry men. And he gets between them and his disciples. If you want to get to me, if you want to get to mine, you got to go through me, is... The positioning. That's just exactly what David did, right? When in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, when he is going to confront the giant, he puts on Saul's stuff, but it doesn't fit. And he goes, I don't need it anyway. Remember, he's just a teenager at this point. Uh, when a lion came, I went out to the lion. When a bear came, I went out to the bear. Just like David went and presented himself to the beast's and in protecting his flock, because that's what shepherds do, so does Jesus. He is the good shepherd. He is putting himself between 
danger and his flock. And then when he gets there, he asks him a very simple question. Whom do you seek? How is he asking this question? Well, I think as we consider the totality from the four Gospels, he's not asking this with anger. He's not asking this with fear. But he's asking this question with a perfect calm and a peace that surpasses our understanding. And so in this scene, so far, in this scene, who's in control? Jesus is in control. The devil is not. Judas is not. The Jews, the multitude, are not. Jesus clearly is. Verse 5. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. So there's a whole bunch packed here in uh, three sentences. Uh, The band of men, when asked, who do you seek? What's their answer? Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus from Nazareth. Notice they did not say, uh, you. Why did they not say you in answer to the question? Because, well, they didn't recognize him. How is it that they didn't recognize him? Well, I think they're blinded by sight because of the darkness, just as they're blinded in their heart by unbelief. They don't recognize Jesus. But in identifying their target, they say Jesus of Nazareth. They're looking for a man named Jesus from Nazareth. And he is a blasphemous man. He is a danger both politically and religiously to this nation. We're here to arrest him. They do not, and so staying Jesus of Nazareth, they do not believe that Jesus is from heaven, as he has said. They do not believe that he is God became man, as he has said, and as he has clearly demonstrated time and time again. They do not believe he is the fulfillment of scripture, what God has given to them in advance. The seed of the woman, not the son born of a virgin, not the Messiah, the servant of God, not the Christ. They believe he's a man from Nazareth. How does Jesus respond? I am. Now, if you're reading the King James, there's another word after that. He. But what what do you notice about he? It's in italics. What do the italics tell us? It's not there in the original manuscript, so the translators had enough integrity and honesty to put the things that they put in, in italics. What Jesus said was, I am. Now, this is recorded in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is written to the church. It presents Jesus as the Son of God. And therefore, in this Gospel, and not in the other three, in this Gospel are the I am statements of Jesus. He has said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. And point blank to the Pharisees in John chapter 8, before Abraham was, I am. And they knew what he was saying because they picked up stones to, to kill him. So just what he said in John chapter 8 Jesus says again here. You see, he is, what's he saying about his identity? That he's the Lord. Oh, he, is he Jesus of Nazareth? Yeah, yeah. But he's so much more than that. So much more than that. And, and finally, where do we see Judas? He's with the enemies of Jesus. He's chosen. He's picked a side. His affiliation is very clear. Verse 6. As soon then, as he had said unto them, I am, they went backward and fell on the ground. So, when God speaks to man, one of two things happens. The man who who humbles himself before God 
falls forward, falls on his knees, falls on his face. Or the man who does not humble himself before God is pushed backwards by God. What happens here? They're pushed backwards. When Jesus said, I am, there was a divine power that pushed them back, knocked them down. Who? All of them. All 500 of them. Oh, that includes Judas, right? All of them. And so what we have is an unmistakable display before everyone there in the garden, an unmistakable display of the power of Jesus Christ. To those who doubt his identity, he should leave no doubt. But I think there's more to it than that. In the light of Scripture, God who desires none to perish, but all would come to repentance and receive the gift of salvation. God who will that every man would be saved. With this I am, Jesus to the multitude is giving them an opportunity to repent, a chance to rethink this whole thing and maybe make a different choice about why they're there. Verse 7. Then asked he them again. Give them another chance. Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus gave the multitude an opportunity to repent, an opportunity to reconsider, to rethink, to make a different choice as to who he is and why they're there. Uh, Do they take it? No. They are still looking for Jesus from Nazareth, a man who claims to be equal with God. They are not seeking the Lord. They are opposing themselves, rejecting Jesus' gift of repentance. Verse 8, Jesus answered, I have told you that I am. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spake, of them which thou gavest me, I have I lost none. Jesus said, verse 8, the Holy Spirit through John records verse 9. Jesus did not say verse 9, he said verse 8. Jesus who knew all things that would come upon him, knows why they're here. He knows how this is going to end up. Uh, They've come in a great force against him. But what's, what's going on here? If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way. They've come with a great force to capture him and to arrest him. But who's giving all the orders? Jesus is giving all the orders. He's in charge. God is in control of what's going on here in the garden. But he says to them, if you've come to take me by force, let my disciples go free, unspoken, because your issue is with me. Your issue is not with them. And in so doing and in so saying, he fulfills, flipping to the left, to John chapter 17, the words that he prayed to the Father about them, John 17, verse 12. While I was with them, that would be the disciples, the 11, in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And so now here in John chapter 18, his words come to pass. And the son of perdition is there in the garden now and he has a prearranged sign let's pick up some more details in Mark chapter 14 let's go back to Mark 14 picking up in verse 45 where we left off and as soon as he that would be Judas as soon as he was come he goeth straightway to him and saith, Master, Master, and kissed him. And they laid their hands on him and took him. So when this has happened in Mark, 
Jesus has done chapter 18. Jesus has established his authority over the situation in the garden. He's given the entire multitude an opportunity to repent. They choose not to. Their plan, which is the plan of the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees, the leadership of the people who caused them to err, is unchanged. So, Judas, after he gets back on his feet, I mean, think about that. Think about that. Who do you see? Jesus went forth. It's not Judas came first. Jesus went first. Who do you seek? Well, I am. That includes Judas. Once Judas got back on his feet, having been knocked down by divine power, he proceeds to walk directly to Jesus and say, first of all, say, Master, Master. And what do we know? Uh, What's the Jewish thing when a word is duplicated? It speaks of emphasis. The word is master. You are my master. Master, master. Is that true? No. It's a lie. What is true is, what is being emphasized in reality is his stab in the back of Jesus by saying him master, master. And then he kissed him. This is a different word. The first time we read kiss, it was, you know, the friendly greeting, common. This is a different Greek word. This word kissed means earnestly, an exaggerated demonstration, the prearranged sign. We're going to be there in the dark. Judas is making sure, he's doing a show, he's putting on a show. He is making sure that the armed guys know who the target is. So he amps it up a bit. Uh, Wow. Wow. There's more detail for us in Matthew chapter 26. So let's go there. Our first time in Matthew 26. So we pick it up in verse 49. And forthwith, he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. Uh, Matthew records Judas's greeting a little differently than does Mark. He says, Hail. Hail was a peaceful and cheerful greeting. Is Judas's purposes peaceful? And cheerful? No. Judas is a flat out liar. He is an actor. He is acting. He's a hypocrite. Not just a betrayer. He's a liar and he's a hypocrite. Wow. And this ha- after having been knocked down by the power of Jesus, which made me wonder, and I have no answer, how bold is evil, even in the face of God. Makes you shake your head. Verse 50. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then they can, excuse me, then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. Uh, Mark does not record Jesus' response to Judas's greeting. But obviously we get that detail here in Matthew. What is Jesus' response? Friend. Friend. Is Jesus being sarcastic? No. He's being gracious. He's being kind. Now, remember a couple things. Jesus is not surprised. He knew all things that would come upon him. These things were known before the foundation of the world. He's already said to the 12, in fact, in John chapter 6, that one of you is a devil. He knows. Uh, Jesus, even this night, humbled himself to wash the feet of Judas, just like he did all of them. But Judas was expelled 
before Jesus said to the remaining 11, greater love has no man than this, that he lay his life down for his friends. If you do what I say, you are my friends. I don't call you servants. I call you friends because the master doesn't tell the servant what he's doing, but he does his friends. Judas wasn't there. We might get the feeling if we just took that alone that, well, Judas is no longer Jesus' friend. What does Jesus call him here? He calls him friend. And so his tone of voice, I believe, is gentle to Judas as well as to the multitude, just like a shepherd would be to his sheep and just like a sheep that's being led to the slaughter. That's his heart. That's his mind. Those are the tones of his words. But he asked Judas a question. Why are you here? Oh, wait a minute. Does Jesus know why Judas is here? Yes. So why ask the question? To give Judas an opportunity to come clean and to repent. Jesus went to the max. He went to the end. Judas will not be able to stand before God at the great white throne judgment and said, you are not fair. You didn't give me a chance to repent. Oh, yes, I did. Yes, I did. But did Jesus, excuse me, did Judas accept this opportunity to repent? No, no, he rejected this one too. And so is fulfilled in Psalm 41, verse 9. Yea, my own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Now, there's still more details in Luke chapter 22. So let's go to your bookmark in Luke 22. We'll pick up his account in verse 47. And while he spake, behold, the multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? We have to read our Bibles carefully, thinking and praying as we do. Where's Judas? As a part of the multitude, where is Judas? He went before them. He's on point. Judas is on point because he knows where Jesus is. And as he approached to give the sign, the prearranged sign to the multitude, as he approached to do that, what happened? Jesus went to him and stole the thunder. He said to him, have you come to betray the Son of Man with a kiss? He's, Jesus exposes the lie. He exposes the hypocrisy and the betrayal before it happens. Which makes me wonder, shouldn't this have stopped Judas dead in his tracks? And it makes me wonder, what is the depth of evil in man's heart? And how deceitful. How deceitful and desperately wicked is the heart of man? We don't get an answer to that question. We're told that it is, but we don't know the depth. But we see things like this and go, oh my gosh. How evil is the heart of man? Now, Jesus had told the 12 and then the 11 also that on this night, one of you is going to betray me. As Jesus goes forward to Judas to ask him, do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? He is telling the 11 behind him who the betrayer is. The betrayer is Judas. And now that the 11 know that, how do they respond? Uh, in the flesh. Verse 49. When they which were about him, that would be the 11, saw what would follow, oh, here's 500 men, 
They got swords, they got clubs, they got lanterns, they got torches. Things are going to get really ugly. They said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? Lord, do we fight? We will die with you. Remember? Shall we fight? Verse 50. And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Uh, They asked a question, Lord, should we fight? Has the Lord answered yet? No. One of them, not waiting for direction from the Lord, takes matters, impulsively so, takes matters into his own hands and cuts off the right ear of the servant of the high priest, which begs all sorts of questions, but we don't have time for that. Uh, Verse 51. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. So they asked the question, Lord, should we fight? Uh, Jesus gives them the answer, but before he can give them the answer, uh, an attack has been made and a man has been wounded. But his answer to them, Lord, shall we fight? Is stand down. Or maybe explicitly now because we've got a wounded man, uh, leave this man alone. And what did Jesus do about that? He made right that which was wrong. The servant swinging his sword and attacking one of the 500 was wrong. Jesus makes right the wrong by healing him, making him whole. The ear is now as it was about 10 seconds ago. Whoa. Ah. Let's think about that for a moment. The servant of the high priest was one of the band, one of the multitude. They're his enemies. To one of his enemies, who really is being caused to err by his leaders, but nonetheless, one of his enemies, to to him, Jesus is loving and compassionate. And to the disciples, he's still teaching them. He's still teaching them. And he's doing it by example. Now, this is the last healing miracle of Jesus before the cross. If you ever wonder, where is the last healing miracle of Jesus before the cross? Where would you go? Let's see. Uh, The doctor would write about that. That's right, Dr. Luke. It's in the Gospel of Luke. And so, uh, think about this whole scene. Wouldn't this, Jesus, stand down, stand down, boys, and then taking the ear and healing it, wouldn't this action and the love and the kindness with which it was done, wouldn't that have stopped everybody in their tracks and caused them to rethink this whole thing? Wouldn't you think it would? I mean... This miracle, a demonstration of the healing touch of God himself, uh, a demonstration of love and compassion and mercy should have arrested this whole scene. But it didn't. And the, the leadership who are causing the people to err, the Pharisees, the elders, the chief priests, they should have fallen on their face before their creator to plead for mercy and to worship him. But that's not how it goes down. So once again, I'm left to wonder, how deep is the evil that's in man's heart? How deep was the evil in my heart before I humbled myself before Jesus? It's breathtaking, breathtaking. Now, Matthew's got more information for us, so let's go back to Matthew chapter 26. Resuming in verse 51. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place, 
For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Uh, Mark, Matthew, has more of what Jesus said at that moment than just stand down. Uh, He tells them, uh, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. And so in this moment, which is a tinderbox, what's a tinderbox? Something with even just a little spark is going to blow. And this is a tinderbox. And Jesus is in the very center of it. So in this tinderbox, Jesus is teaching his disciples. He's still teaching his disciples. He's teaching that violence is not the answer to violence. In fact, violence begets violence. And we're going to see, as is revealed in the course of Scripture, that the followers of Jesus Christ are given a different kind of sword. We're given the Word of God, which is sharper than a two-edged sword. We're giving we're given the sword of the Spirit. This is our weapon. This is how we fight evil and violence. The weapons we 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 war in the we walk in the flesh, but we don't war in the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The warfare is spiritual, not physical. We're fighting against principalities and powers. We're fighting against the darkness. We don't need a saber, a physical sword. We need God's sword. So he's planting that seed, which will be revealed to them later. Violence begets violence. And I think also unspoken, what he's saying to them is, you know, Uh, I don't need your help, boys. You need my help. And the problem that you see with the eyes in your head is not the problem. There's a bigger problem that I've come to fight. Verse 53. He continues speaking. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be. The teaching continues. If Jesus wanted to fight these 500 men, whom he all knocked down to the ground with his spoken word, but if he wanted to physically fight these 500 men, all he has to do is ask. And the Father would give him what? Special forces. Yep. A whole bunch of special forces support. Twelve legions. A legion is 5,000 men. You know the math? Twelve times 5,000? 60,000 angels. Now, let's think about that for a moment. In the history of Israel, during the reign of King Hezekiah, the Assyrians who had pretty much taken the northern kingdom captivity, destroyed Samaria, decided, well, while we're here, we're going down to Jerusalem. We're going to do that too. And they were camped all around Jerusalem. And Hezekiah prayed. And, in, and, and how did the Lord answer? One angel. What kind of damage did the one angel do? 185,000 Assyrians. So if all things are linear, and they probably wouldn't, We can do the math. 60,000 times 185,000 is a little over 11 billion. Could 500, who are going to end up looking like Girl Scout brownies, could they take on 12 legions of angels? All of humanity couldn't. I, Peter, put... Oops, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, Put your sword away. If this was a physical fight, the Father would give me overwhelming power, overwhelming force. So what does that tell us? What does that tell the disciples? What does that tell the 500? It tells us that by refusing to use overwhelming force, Jesus is giving to them and to us undeniable proof that his death 
is going to be voluntary. He has the power to lay his life down. He has the power to take it up again. And that's exactly what's going to happen in fulfillment of the scriptures. And what does Jesus say over and over again about the scriptures? Must be fulfilled. Jesus said it. God said it. God meant it. God is going to do it, regardless of what man does. So, Let's continue this scene by going back to John chapter 18. We see some more things about this whole scene in John 18. Resuming in verse 10. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Okay, not in Mark, not in Matthew, not in Luke, do we get the name of the sword-wielding disciple. (laughs) John gives that to us. And it is, and who's surprised? But anyway, it's Peter. And identified as Simon Peter. Simon is his name in the flesh. You should be called Cephas. You'd be called Peter. Which, Which one is first? Simon or Peter? He's in his flesh. Simon, I will die with you, Peter. Is re- Interesting thing, though. He is ready and willing to go to war. With how many? Against how many, rather? 500. Is he a crazy man? Is he out of his mind? Not sure that I believe that he is. He is a courageous man. He displays that time and time again. But he has also said some remarkable things of faith. He just witnessed Jesus say, I am. And every one of those guys were knocked to the ground. It's as if he's saying, Jesus, you and me, we got this. Well, you got it, but I'm going to help you. Uh, So it's, I think, an act of great courage and faith that he's willing to go to war with 500. But in the scheme of things, because we know what happens... In maybe 30 minutes or so, what's Peter going to do? He's going to be confronted by a little maiden girl. Who says, ah, you're one of his. And three times he will deny that he even knows Jesus. Which is going to expose the fear that it's in his heart. Fear and faith. It's like he's double-minded. Wow, he's just like us. <laughs> That's exactly right. But, all right, so we have Simon Peter's name, but also John gives us the name of the high priest servant. His name is Malchus. Why would the Holy Spirit tell us this man's name? I don't know, but I have some questions. Uh, Is Jesus filled with compassion for the lost sheep of Israel? Does Jesus love his enemies? Did Jesus bless someone who came to curse him and persecute him? Did Jesus make him whole rather than condemn and destroy him? Did Jesus return good for evil and therefore overcome evil with good? Yeah. Do you think Jesus' sword pierced Malchus' heart? Uh, Do you think love conquered hate and violence in Malchus' heart? Do you think one day we're going to meet this man, Malchus? And maybe some of the 500 who were there? Yeah, so at least we know his name. (laughs) Verse 11. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Not recorded in Mark, not recorded in Matthew, not recorded in Luke. Is this question from Jesus to Peter? And I think it's a question that is going to stick in Peter's mind for the rest of his life. The cup. What's the cup? A cup of suffering. 
and death, violent death even, for all mankind. The cup which my Father has given me. The Jews are not giving it to me. The Gentiles are not giving it to me. My Father is giving it to me. Shall I not drink it? Shall I not obey my Father, regardless of the personal cost to me? Wow, a piercing, heavy question. And it's a rhetorical question because the answer is obviously yes. I am going to do the will of my Father. And he is telling Peter and the other ten and the 500 because they're probably close enough to hear. And he's telling us because his words are recorded for us. He's telling all of us that there is no turning back. He is committed. He is in his mind and in his will. He is resolved. He's not in the least bit reluctant to lay down his life as his father's substitute sin sacrifice for the sins of man, for my sins and for yours. He was committed to do that. And considering the other accounts, you know, he could be saying, you know, I, Peter, I don't have to do this. Understand, I don't have to do this. Twelve legions of angels is an option available to me. But I want to do this. My food, my meat is to do the will of my Father and to finish the work. I will do this. I want to do this. I came here to seek and to save the lost. I came here to be lifted up and to draw all men unto me. Done. It's established. But now Jesus is going to turn to the multitude who are there watching, listening, come to do something in particular. And he's going to rebuke them and he's going to rebuke the leaders in particular because they're the ones who are causing the people to err and to lead them into destruction. So let's go back to Luke chapter 22. Resuming in verse 52. Then Jesus said unto the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders which were come to him, be ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves. When I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. So he's speaking to the leaders of the band and he's calling them out for two things. Number one, he's calling them out for coming after him with such force as if he was a violent robber, a character that he has never displayed, but a character they have repeatedly displayed. So they come reflecting their nature, their heart, not his. They've deceived themselves. He calls them out for it. And the other thing he calls them out for is for having passed up who knows how many opportunities to take him in the temple. After all, the temple was their jurisdiction. They passed on many opportunities to take, to, to take him while he was in the temple, but they didn't take any of those opportunities. Why not? Because every one of those was in broad daylight. And that's not how darkness operates. And every one of those opportunities would have been before thousands of eyewitnesses. And that's not how darkness operates. But this is the way it is. Because it's their hour. It's the hour of the power of darkness. Darkness, unbelief, sin. The power of darkness is Satan. This is your hour. This is Satan's hour. This is the hour for the devil and his kids. Now, we know that the devil lost the battle with Jesus 
in the garden. But now, this is his hour with men. And so what we have going forward now, all the way through the cross, what we have going forward now, moving in peril, synchronized, if you will, the will of God, the will of Satan, and the will of men, all on the same page. But what is God's will? Maybe a little more clearly in Matthew chapter 26. How Matthew records this heartbroken rebuke by Jesus. Matthew 26, resuming in verse 55. In that same hour, said Jesus to the multitudes, Are ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. So, Jesus is telling them, this is happening the way it's happened. Because God said it was going to happen this way. You're not in control. My Father is in control. I am in control. God is in control. And all y'all are fulfillment of prophetic scripture. Ooh. Whoa. God spoke of you guys centuries ago. And here you are. Here I am. This is the way it's going down. But verse 56 concludes, Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Didn't Jesus tell them earlier in the night that you are going to abandon me? You're going to fulfill Zechariah 9. You're going to flee. He's told them that. And now it happens. Just a little while ago, it seemed like Peter was willing to go to war with 500 I don't know if he emboldened the other 10, but now fear blossoms and they abandon Jesus and run for their lives. And Jesus is arrested. No, he's not resisting arrest. Uh, He's not fighting back. Why? This is the father's plan. Now, the arrest of Jesus, let's read about that in John chapter 18. Picking up in verse 12. Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Annas first. They came to seize Jesus. They now seize him. They tie him up and they lead him away. Time to go to trial. You're guilty of a crime. They've already, they already know the sentence, but it's time for the show trial. Uh, they're taking him to Annas first for his trial. He's bound. He's tied up. Did the ropes bind Jesus? Would any rope bind Samson? Is Jesus stronger than Samson? So no, the ropes did not bind Jesus. What did? His love for them and his love for me and his love for you. There's one final detail in Mark's gospel, Mark 14. Finishing up the betrayal and arrest of Jesus in the garden with verses 51 and 52 of Mark 14. And there followed him a certain young man having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young man, the young men laid hold on him And he left the linen cloth and fled for them naked. So now we have have the 11 disciples, right? But they fled. There must be, now we have a young man. He's not named. He's there too. And the temple police grab him, get a hold of his garment, and he (laughs) gets rid of the, he gets out of the garment and he flees naked. Who is this? Well, it's only speculation. 
This is the gospel of... But whose gospel is it? It's Peter's. Mark transcribed. Mark wrote. It's assigned to him, but these are... This is Peter's. Now, could this be John Mark? He would have been a teenager about this time. That qualifies as a, a young man. Uh, is this Mark? Speculation. What does Scripture say? Doesn't. End of story. That's all we need. But it's part of the thing. So the arrest, the betrayal, and the arrest of Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. There is a lot of very poignant application for both the believer and the unbeliever. So let's take the believer first. Those of us who have put our faith in Jesus Christ, who are new creatures in Christ, who trust in him. A couple of things. First of all, Jesus is always teaching us. He never stops teaching us. Are we always teachable? That's on us. We have to receive. Become doers of the word and not hearers only, lest we deceive ourselves. You see, in this scene, when Jesus is being betrayed by a friend and he's being arrested and he knows what's going to come after that, he is still teaching his disciples. And so he is teaching us in every circumstance, in every circumstance, no matter how heavy, no matter how dire, no matter how crushing, Jesus is there teaching. What's he teaching us? Look at me. Don't look at the circumstance. Look at me. Eyes on me. Keep eyes on me. Because we know that circumstances are fleeting. But Jesus is forever. Keep your eyes on forever. Focus on forever, not on the fleeting. And no matter how big the circumstance is, who's bigger? Always. Jesus is always bigger. And he's also saying to us, you know, keep, keep your eyes on me. Trust me. I see. I know. I care. I got this. Just trust me. And so this kind of harkens back to one of the applications from last week. It takes more faith to surrender to the will of our Father in heaven than it takes to ask him to help us according to our desire. He's teaching us faith. He's always teaching us faith. Second thing for us believers the exhortation to be Christ-like. <laughs> in every circumstance, be Christ-like. In this awful situation, Jesus is true and faithful. And therefore, we're to be Christ-like in every circumstance. And Jesus taught us by words, and he taught us by example. He's not asking us to do something that he hadn't done. No, he's done it far greater than we'll ever have to do it. And in this circumstance, violence begets violence. Violence doesn't solve anything. What conquers violence? The love of God. The love of God. You see, Satan is a liar. He's a murderer. And so hatred and fear and violence... That's his MO. Scripture tells us God is love and compassion and meekness and goodness and kindness and gentleness. That's his MO. So no matter the circumstance, be Christ like. Because we know the end. God wins. Love wins. <laughs> love always wins. And praise God for that because nothing, not even Satan, nothing can separate us for the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And as vessels of that love, be doers of that love no matter the circumstance. That means our marching orders as soldiers in the Lord's army, if you will, 
our, our marching orders are to be Christ-like, to do and to say as Jesus did and said. Turn the other cheek. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you and persecute you. Overcome evil with good. Even your betrayer, someone who's betrayed you, betrayed by a friend. Friend. I've been betrayed by a friend. And the Lord convicted me about a month, month and a half ago, whatever, by asking me a very simple question. Have you ever prayed that I bless your betrayer? No. Oh, okay. Okay. And I did. I did. It's sincerely. Because I know that's what Jesus would do. And Holy Spirit, you have to help me. Help me. And he did, and I did, and I was relieved to a, at a level I didn't know I needed to be. Be Christ-like in all circumstances. The third thing for us children of God is knowing that, yes, evil is unbelievably great, but Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. He is going to go to the cross. He, from our point of view in time, has gone to the cross and bore the weight, the entire weight of all evil in all places, in all times, from all hearts. He bore it all. And we're told that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And so... Let's not focus on the evil. Are the days we live in evil? Should we take note? Should we be wise? Should we freak out? No. No. Things are falling into place. Just as God said they would. In it, we don't return evil for evil. We return good for evil. Grace. Forgiveness. Kindness. Love. And, and so as it, reply, as it applies to us and these incredibly evil days in which we live, don't ever forget Jesus is much greater than this evil. So peace, have peace. And the fourth thing for us is about boldness. How bold is evil? even in the face of God. How bold. It's shocking. It's breathtaking. We should have that boldness. We should even have more boldness to do a couple things. Number one, march into the throne room of our Father to ask for the help that we need. We're to go with boldness into the throne. And we're also to be bold in our witness of Jesus Christ how much he loves those who hate them and the price, the personal price he paid that they might be reconciled unto God. Boldness. We all need some more boldness, right? It's one of those things that come with the Holy Spirit. Ask. When you're in the moment and you know the Lord's presented you an opportunity to say something or maybe do something that your flesh doesn't want to say or do, Lord, help me. Holy Spirit, come. Give, give. I need boldness. And then say the first word, take the first step, and watch what the Spirit of God will do through you. All right. But there's also a poignant lesson for the unbeliever, if there are any here, if there are any there, uh, those who have not confessed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, uh, those who are the Lord of their own lives. Uh, Very, just one thing to consider. And it's the question that Jesus asked. Whom seek ye? Who do you seek? Are you seeking love? Are you seeking peace and happiness? Are you seeking help in some situation that's much bigger than you 
and you may even be in danger? Are you seeking victory over the addictions that plague you? If any of those things are true, then be still and listen to the still, small voice that's speaking to you right now, saying to you, I am. That's Jesus. By his Holy Spirit, he's speaking directly to you. Will you humble yourself before him? Agree with him. Confess your sin. Repent of your sin. And receive forgiveness. Receive the newness of life. And receive more than you ever even dreamed of asking for. Or will you resist and get knocked backward? Your your maker is giving you an opportunity to repent come and be reconciled to him and he's not going to strive forever therefore today is the day of salvation will you voluntarily in a brokenness that God thinks is beautiful will you bend your knee and confess with your tongue that Jesus is the Christ the son of the living God that's the simple message for you in all of this Will you stand with me, please? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the spirit who is our teacher, who is our guide into all truth, and all these things are true. In a horrific scene, if we were to put ourselves in Jesus' place and imagine these things happening to us, in a horrific scene... Jesus did not condemn those who've come to take him. No, on the contrary. He came to take their sin. And Lord, we relate. When you came to us and said, I am, you didn't come to condemn us. You came to save us. You came to take our sin. And Lord, we praise you for doing that. Thank you for relieving us of that burden. And thank you, by your grace, giving us something we do not deserve, your life. And so all the honor, all the praise, and all the glory is yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.